Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts Channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Today's case is called Cloudy Evidence. 57-year-old Linda Collins Smith had come a long way from her humble upbringing. She was born on April 17, 1962, in Pocahontas, Arkansas, to a poor family that lived 10 miles down a dirt road. She would trek every day to the local creek and bring water back to the house until her teenage years, when plumbing was finally added. From there, she attended high school in nearby Williford before she met and married a local judge named Philip Smith. While she worked to raise the couple's two children, Linda also worked as a real estate agent until 2001, when the couple bought and ran the Days Inn in Pocahontas. She worked hard to increase tourism to the area by serving on both local boards for tourism and holding several positions with the Chamber of Commerce. In 2011, she ran and won the election to serve as a member of the Arkansas House of Representatives which she would do from 2011 to 2013, and after that, she became a state senator in 2015. In 2017, during her term as senator, she and Philip filed for divorce. The proceedings were messy, and at the end of it, the court not only granted the divorce, but reprimanded Philip, which led to him agreeing to no longer serve as a judge. A few years would pass. On June 4, 2019, her son Butch was starting to worry about his mother. No one in the family had heard from Linda in a week, and her social media, which she was usually very active on, had stopped posting on May 28. Worried, he and his grandfather, Benny Collins, drove to her home in Pocahontas to check on her. When they arrived at about 5.30 p.m., they were greeted with a smell that could not be ignored. When they started to walk up the driveway, they found the source, wrapped in one of Butch's old comforters, lying face down under a tarp, was a human body that looked as though it had sat there for some time. They were unable to tell who the person was, but feared the worst and called 911. Although visual identification was not possible, it didn't take long for the medical examiner to determine that they had indeed found Linda's body. Her cause of death was due to multiple stab wounds. Investigators were able to determine that she had been moved from the inside of her house to the driveway. Her death also coincided with her disappearance from social media on May 28th, giving them their estimated time of death. As officers rushed to question friends and family, they quickly decided that there were two primary persons of interest and her ex-husband, Philip, was one of them. However, when questioned, Philip and his wife both had solid alibis and were removed from the suspect list. The other was a friend and former campaign aide named Rebecca O'Donnell. She worked for Linda on her campaigns in 2014 and 2018. After she left politics, Rebecca worked for Linda as an assistant. 48-year-old Rebecca had also been born and raised in the Pocahontas area. During the campaigns and after, Linda and Rebecca were inseparable. They not only worked together, but took trips and attended the same social events. When investigators questioned Rebecca, she claimed that on May 28th, Linda had just returned from a business trip. She met her at the airport before taking her home and preparing her lunch. After that, she had no idea where Linda had gone. Officers found this odd. If the two women were inseparable, as everyone claimed, why hadn't Rebecca called police well before Linda's son noticed his mother was missing nearly a week later? As the Collins family prepared for a funeral, investigators were still hard at work at her home, trying to find any clues to her murder. They didn't find a lot, but one thing that confused everyone was a security camera that they found. A single security camera. Investigators contacted the company that produced the cameras, named Arlo, on June 14th, Arlo provided them with copies of recordings from Linda's house from the day she died. Investigators also learned that on the day of the murder, Linda's security account had been breached and several videos were deleted. Luckily, three videos were missed. They had been saved to the cloud, and Arlo was able to provide them to investigators. 
On those recordings, at 4.48 p.m., was an exterior shot from a driveway camera. The sound of a woman screaming can be heard. The next video at 5.19 p.m. shows O'Donnell standing over Linda's body with blood on her hands and shirt while she holds a large knife. The last video from 5.20 p.m. shows O'Donnell removing cameras from the home. She's then seen leaving the residence with Linda's red purse and the cameras, but it appears she missed one. Linda's phone was not recovered from the scene. Video evidence led officers to believe that O'Donnell had taken not only Linda's purse, but her cell phone as well, and used the phone app to delete most of the footage. As the community prepared to attend Linda's funeral on the 15th, officers stopped O'Donnell and her fiancé, a man named Tim Loggins, for questioning as they drove to the service. When they talked to Loggins, they found that he corroborated Rebecca O'Donnell's story for the day of the murder. He also added that O'Donnell had also been to Linda's house multiple times that week, a fact that Butch also backed up. Loggins was shocked that his fiancée was now considered the prime suspect and insisted she just wasn't capable of such an act. When O'Donnell was questioned about the video, she claimed that the most incriminating one was actually harmless. The knife and blood were from a chicken that she had cut up for Linda's lunch. But what about the shots of her removing cameras? She claimed that they were not holding a charge as they were advertised, and her fiancé had taken them down to return them to Best Buy. She insisted that she didn't know what had happened to her friend and had nothing to do with her murder. When they questioned her family, they learned of a possible motive from Rebecca's sister. O'Donnell's sister claimed that in 2014, Rebecca had not only stolen her boyfriend, but opened credit cards in her children's names that she soon maxed out and refused to pay off. Her family also claimed that O'Donnell had stolen her mother's retirement money, an amount of $160,000. They also found an incident where a store owner in Jonesboro, Arkansas, had called police to report her for theft. O'Donnell was held and questioned. On June 17th, she was charged with capital murder, tampering with physical evidence, and abuse of a corpse. She pleaded not guilty. By the fall of 2019, O'Donnell was pleading her case to fellow inmates. To at least three women, she claimed that she had been framed. She told these other inmates that the videos police held in evidence were manipulated to make her look guilty. And those videos of her removing the cameras, she said... They had removed them and then framed her for it. She continually insisted that she didn't stab Linda 16 times, a detail that had never been released to the public. She also told them the story of cutting up chicken and getting covered in blood, but even they knew that a raw chicken has very little blood and unless she killed it herself, could not have the amount that was shown in the videos. She also asked fellow inmates to help her out. She wanted Linda's ex-husband, Philip, and his wife to be killed in a way that made it look like Philip killed her and then himself. She even provided a forged note as backup. She also wanted the prosecutor in her case to be killed as well before a bomb was to be set off at the Randolph County Jail where her car was held. This would destroy any evidence that she insisted had been planted inside. She also needed a hacker, someone who could hack both the county's computers and Arlo's and embed a virus that would destroy their system and videos. As payment, she insisted that the women could take, quote, a bag of gold and silver from Phillips Mammoth Springs home. Rebecca had actually done this before when she took gold and silver from Linda and Phillips' house, which she then sold for fifteen dollars to $18,000. When investigators asked Philip about this, he claimed that during their divorce, about $25,000 in gold and silver coins that he owned were indeed found to be missing from their home. Thankfully, the three women that O'Donnell tried to draw into her plot refused the offer. When she reportedly asked the next inmate for help with her diabolical plot, she decided to add those first three inmates to her new kill list. At trial, the prosecution's case focused on greed. The prosecutor and Linda's family believed that the ex-senator had caught O'Donnell embezzling and stealing from her. When she confronted her friend, 
the woman snapped and stabbed her to death. The former aide admitted that she forged checks in Linda's name. She countered this, however, to say that she couldn't have stolen any money because Collins had not had an income since January. She said that this forced her to take money out of the hotel's accounts to pay Collins' bills. When she was confronted with all of the evidence, including jailhouse testimony from the other inmates, on August 6, 2020, Rebecca O'Donnell pled guilty to first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse. In court, she admitted, quote, I went to Linda's house and I intentionally killed her and then hid the body. She was also charged with two counts of solicitation to commit capital murder in another county to which she pled no contest. A day later, she was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Her date of release is in 2070 when she will be 99 years old. After sentencing, the Collins family released this statement to the press. Today, our family has found swift justice. We know that there will be some that will not be satisfied with the outcome, and we realize that whatever punishment O'Donnell receives, it will never be enough. It will never bring my grandpa's daughter back, or my mother back, or our children's grandmother back. No amount of punishment will ever fill that void that O'Donnell made in our lives the day she killed our mother. Case Cracked we would like to thank People.com, Heavy.com, KAIT8.com, NEAReport.com, KATV.com, The Arkansas Times, and Arlo.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is to discuss it with us now. All right, Christy, so I think the big question on my mind, and probably a lot of people out there, uh, do we know if they actually found the murder weapon? I never found anything that listed that they found it. Um, from everything that I read, it honestly looks like it was one of Collins's kitchen knives that she used. They have her on video with it, but no article said that they ever actually recovered it or what it was other than a knife. Yeah, I'm also curious about the cameras. So, it, I mean, it seems like she was doing a pretty obvious cleanup effort. She probably took some of the more important stuff. I would imagine that the knife got lumped in with the cameras and who knows where she took those, you know, a dumpster somewhere or a pond or a lake somewhere. Yeah. Um, okay. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, you mentioned that research on this was a little tough, right? It was right after the murder happened, a gag order was placed. And even after the trial, there's large gaps in the information. It's, it's, it gets hard to piece it together sometimes. Okay. Well, I think you did a great job because this thing uh, certainly told a complete story and, and flowed just fine. Um, now, something else you sent over in the notes that I'm kind of curious about, despite the fact that she pled guilty, Rebecca O'Donnell still claims to be innocent? Yeah. She claims that all of the evidence was placed there against her. She was framed. The police are responsible. She's She's got some unusual stories that she goes with, but she claims she had to say she was guilty in court. She had no choice, but she's really innocent. It just, you know... Reminds me of, um, I don't know if you've ever dealt with someone in your life that wasn't being honest with you, but there's mm, yeah. there's almost this, you can back them up to the point where you can prove them wrong, but they'll never go beyond that, you know? Yeah. And here she is uh, admitting to a court, yeah, I did it. And literally saying it word for word. I mean, we, we read the quote. She's saying mm -hmm. she went over there and she specifically did this. But after the fact, she's going to retract that to everyone she's talking to and then kind of weave in some of her old excuses, right? This is all yes. a big setup right from the start. Um, and that's just, yeah, the next part of the setup. Yeah. Um, so you're saying they also found some interesting charges from her past. I know we didn't go into all that in the actual script. Can you give us some insight on that? This one was surprising. I found this at the Arkansas Times, and it tells us that the state police investigation also turned up the fact that O'Donnell had been accused by a tipster of offering to hire someone to kill her former husband, Jeff O'Donnell, in 2007 in return for $50,000 from his life insurance policy. When the state police investigated it in March of that year, O'Donnell told them that she did make statements about her husband being dead and also admitted mentioning $50,000 but an investigator reported she said she was drunk when she made the statements. Near the conclusion of the interview, I asked her how serious she was on a scale of one to 10, and she said five or six, but I was drunk. 
No further information was developed. Uh, her husband changed the beneficiary on the account. They divorced and no charges were filed. So interestingly, some of that lines up pretty close with what we're seeing here. Uh, it does. Especially with what she's trying to do with the inmates, you know, set up these kind of hit jobs. And in a similar way where <laughs> she obviously doesn't have the resources herself. She's not saying, I'm going to pay you. You know, in that case, she's like, well, I'll tell you where the bag of gold and silver is and you can mm -hmm. go get it for yourselves. And in this case, well, there's a, a life insurance policy is going to kick out and then we'll give you that money. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that even for her being so dishonest and kind of misrepresenting herself, uh, she is quite honest about the fact that she doesn't have the resources when she's trying to pay off these people for these different hit jobs that she's looking for. Yeah, she was something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I also saw in the notes, you were a little confused about what was going on with the security cameras. What's, uh, what's your question about that? Well, all of the articles made it sound like that one security camera was the key and it was, but not in the way they insinuate the information, the videos weren't stored on the camera itself. I know some of them do store that way. Right. This one actually stored on the cloud where Linda had an account. So I would assume that her family knew there were cameras in the house. Well, Somebody had to have known. Yeah. What I'm thinking is um, what might have happened is Rebecca goes through and tries to remove all the cameras and misses one. Mm -hmm. uh, investigators, when they're then processing the scene going through the house, they see that there's one camera that's been left behind that Rebecca had missed. Mm -hmm. So that just gives them the avenue of investigation for, okay, we know that there might've been a security system in here. Maybe most of it's been removed, but we know specifically this is the manufacturer because we've got this one physical camera that we can look at. And yeah. then that opens the door for them to contact that company. The company says, yes, we did have an account for that address or for that specific person. And at that point, wh what I'm kind of interested by is Rebecca was smart enough to know that the videos were likely stored in the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, so then she uses the app to go through and actually delete them. I'm kind of curious if even though they were deleted from the app, if the company wouldn't have been able to retrieve them through backups or something like that. Um, you would think that they would, but what, they but, said those videos were gone. Yeah. Well, the, I think the trick there is, you know, most backup systems are something that like it runs nightly or something mm -hmm. like that. And if she is deleting those videos that same day, like she literally just did this an hour later, she's sitting on the phone and deleting the videos. She might have deleted it before the backup could even take place. Uh, I didn't um, think about that. So that's that, I mean, that's just kind of my assumption about it. And that's that's kind of an oversimplification. Like nowadays there's multiple hard drives that are mm -hmm. keeping shadow copies. And even when you delete, delete something, it's not really deleted. You know, an expert can go in there and kind of bring it back, but it sounds like they didn't have to. I'm really surprised that she missed three videos as it is. Um, well, and she claims that it was her fiance that took down the cameras right. and they have her on film taking down the cameras. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's another trend. I think we covered this kind of mm -hmm. in last week's story a little bit too, where people that lie in this way will frequently point to others and try to make them part of their story because they think that that validates their story in some way. You know, hey, you can go ask, Very true. Go ask my husband. He's he's the one that took him down. And they're like, well, we don't need to ask because we have footage and we can see that you're the one taking him down. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that would lead me to believe that they, they probably... I, I would have to think that they recovered some more of those videos from the different angles. I think the three videos that they did get weren't likely just from that one camera. I think mm -hmm. there was three videos from the multiple cameras that were kind of left behind. And that's why they were able to tell these different things. But um, one way or another, uh, if you guys are looking for home security cameras, make sure they have that functionality. Oh, I, yes. I know it's something I always look into. Um, get that there's certain cameras well they'll they'll store locally and then they'll also upload to the cloud at some point you just want to make sure that that stuff's in the cloud because it used to be in the old days that criminals would know that oh there's a recording device somewhere i need to get to the vcr and get that tape or i need to get to the hard drives or just break that computer or whatever mm -hmm. nowadays it's different because your camera on your doorbell 
basically can be going right to the cloud instantly. It's not even stored in your house at any point. And I know a lot of people are kind of put off by, oh, but there's a monthly fee or something like that. If you look around, yeah. you can find products where there isn't even a monthly fee. But even if there is a monthly fee, it's kind of worth it for... I mean, Especially this, in a case like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This this case is a perfect example. I wish we had a sponsor where I could go like, hey, <laughs> this camera, this is the one that you need. Yeah. Um, but they are out there. So, uh, yeah, you guys should kind of keep that in mind while you're looking for it. Uh, Christy, thank you so much for your hard work on today's case. We always appreciate it. And I've got mm -hmm. some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters and Smith. Melissa Heinbach, Amanda Beard, Think Mutiny Publishing, and Emily Winkle. I would also like to thank everyone that contributed via PayPal and Super Chat donations on our recent live stream to raise money to honor my stepfather. Together, we donated $500 to the American Cancer Society. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover. And we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing just that. Remember, you can get another Lord & Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. Please also don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon down below if you'd like to catch one of our secret, secret studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel. Mm -hmm.